Dr. Martin Lewis is a senior lecturer in the Department of History at Stanford, a member of the Breakthrough Institute. He has numerous publications under his belt and also runs the fascinating website, geocurrents.info. Did I leave anything out, Dr. Lewis? Oh, that sounds very accurate. Well, let's start with your with the quote on your geocurrents blog and tell us about the meaning it has for you and the blog. It says, history without geography, like a dead carcass, hath neither life nor motion. His, history, therefore, and geography, like two fires or meteors, which philosophers call Castor and Pollux, is joined together, crown our reading with delight and profits, if parted, threatened both with a certain uh, shipwreck. And that's from the 17th century. So I find that very poignant. Can you uh, start us off there? Yeah, well, thank you for bringing that to everyone's attention. I had actually forgotten that I had that uh, on my blog. It is one of my favorite quotes. I like the flowery language, but I particularly like the way that it joins history and geography together. I've always been fascinated in both subjects, and I really don't think you can you can do one without the other. You, you can do geography with no history, but I don't think you can offer any explanations. Uh, it just becomes a, a static vision without... Uh, showing what's behind everything. And you uh, really can't do history at all without geography. You can pretend that a country exists on the head of a pin, but I, and sometimes historians do that, but I think you miss most of what's important in doing so. So time and space are, are two dimensions, and ge geography is a little bit more concerned with space, and history obviously with time, but I sort of see them as, as one, one whole uh, subject, really. And, and let's get into that because I remember uh, growing up. I think uh, in many in schools they they often did not tie the two together, and you would kind of look at history separately. And I, I find now more and more we've, we're finding them tied together, um, and geopolitics especially being taught, as well as in your textbook which you contributed to, uh, globalization and diversity. Right. They include as a framework geopolitics. So. For example, you know, I, I'm a both a student and a teacher of history and inter international affairs. I, I personally discovered geopolitics in graduate school, and it really s stuck with me as a method with which to view the world and the reality of what is happening, um, mm -hmm. because, because it factors in geography. And I think this profound study of geography, which includes, you know, resources, demographics, coupled with traditional history and politics, is, is essential to understanding the world. So how would you define the lens through, through which you analyze the world? Oh, uh, yeah, the way I analyze the world is, I suppose, through, through a mixture of, of history and geography. But what I always try to, I'm always asking myself is, how can something be portrayed in a map? Uh, and I want to use maps not merely to show locations, but to advance an argument. Uh, a, Maps can show things that are very difficult to show otherwise. I'm often frustrated. Uh, there are many fine works of history that have a lot of geographical content, but don't use maps. And without maps, uh, it can become quite cumbersome and sort of difficult to understand. So I think I think a well-made map is a, 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 can be a thing of beauty, but it also can convey an information in a way that you just can't do so otherwise. So I'm very interested in, in geopolitics, and probably um, geocurrents has more geopolitical content than anything else. Uh, but I'm really interested in, in almost anything that um, I can explore historically and geographically through maps. So it's, it's a pretty open-ended method, I suppose. Uh, but maps have to be central for, for me. And how would maps, you know, that was going to be my next question, actually, how, how would they assist us in practical terms uh, when we analyze a conflict? Uh, perhaps you can give us a quick example of how you might break or what would be a good way to break down an international crisis and which factors to look at. And, and keeping it really, really, really simple. And you can pick, you know, anything at the top of your mind, uh, anything from, from Syria with the Russian and American. American proxies or, or the civil war in Ukraine or, you know, even the drug war in Mexico where geography is taken into account. How would you break things down and which factors would you would you use? Yeah, well, any of those are great examples. And I've written on, on quite a few of them. You mentioned drug wars in Mexico. 
is the uh, the last thing. And since you're uh, based in Mexico, that might be a good place to start. Mm-hmm. I find that in the United States, most students and most people have a conception that Mexico is a country absolutely torn apart by violent crimes associated with the drug wars. And they think that that violence is going to be everywhere in the country. But I recently did some maps of murder rate in Mexico by state, and of course it varies tremendously. There are, are places in southern Mexico with a, a murder rate that's actually quite low, uh, uh, even by international standards, and then there are areas where it's extremely high. Interesting, that map doesn't correlate at all with a map of economic development. If you, if you overlay a map of GDP by state in Mexico, some quite poor states uh, have very high murder rates, but some have very low murder rates as well. So uh, then you start, have to start looking at maps that show cartels and drug shipment routes, and especially ones that show places where different cartels have been struggling with each other. And then suddenly it starts to make sense why you might have such a high murder rate, say in Chihuahua, which is a generally a, quite a well-developed part of Mexico by by certain uh, measurements. So, so that would certainly be one way. Also, we find that uh, the conflicts in Syria and Iraq, the news media understands that it has to be portrayed by maps. Uh, because our, and especially made maps, because the general maps that we have are not going to show what's going on. You have to show these sort of ever-changing maps of what ISIS is controlling. And a lot of those maps have a very unusual pattern, too, because you don't really have necessarily a stable territorial block, but you have control over roadways and population centers. And so you can get some pretty interesting and complicated maps that, that have emerged. And um, so I've been I've been glad to see those uh, in the media. And it's interesting how you mentioned you know, there's so many factors, and it's not that that simple as you mentioned. In some poor uh, towns in, in Mexico, they they have higher uh, homicide rates, and perhaps in others they don't. And that reminds me with the debate on on gun control. There was a Harvard study done a few years ago where they said, you know, there's nations that have a higher rate of gun um, illegal gun possession but they have lower rates of murder and vice versa. So things are not that simple and you got to bring out the data and the statistics. Absolutely. Right. And uh, often people sort of think it's going to be easy and simplistic and they have those assumptions, but once you start looking at the actual information, usually they get more complicated. And that's uh, something I like about history and geography too, is I think um, historians and geographers tend to embrace complexity. Sometimes some social scientists, political scientists or economists sometimes have a real desire to to simplify things, which is understandable, and I I don't fault them for that. But in history and geography, I think more scholars are more inclined to try to show how complicated things really are and can be. And and what's another thing we can add to if we look at Mexico? So you mentioned the the map of the the homicides. you know, what other maps might we look at to better understand a crisis such as the one going on in Mexico? I'm sure um, you mentioned economic data such as GDP. Uh, we can look at the pathways through which the drug, uh, which towns and states the drugs flow through. What other few factors might you look at? Oh, factors to to map and so far as so that goes. Um, well, you know, one problem we have here here is getting information for making maps of illicit activities like the drug trade. It's really a challenge to do because when we have something that's a, that's legal and above board and the government is gathering data on it, then you can often get some very precise maps. But when it's something that is not legal, then a tremendous amount of guesswork has to go into it. So that's that's one of the limitations, I suppose. It would be awfully nice if we could get uh, more and more detailed maps uh, showing that sort of uh, issue. Uh, one thing I try to uh, impress upon my students, though, is uh, 
it's a, it's a little bit off topic, but sure. I showed them the map of the, the birth rate in Mexico by state because students in the United States all have the impression that Mexico has this extremely high birth rate and that's why there's been so much immigration. But once you look at that birth rate map, it's very clear that all of, all of northern Mexico is at or below the replacement level and most of central Mexico is. As well, it's only when you get into the far south, Chiapas and Oaxaca and a few states, do you get a birth rate that's above the replacement level. And even there, it's not that far above the replacement level. Uh, when you go a little farther south, outside of Mexico into, into northern parts of Central America, then you do get a higher birth rate. And you also get a higher homicide rate. And uh, off a lot of the immigrants coming into the United States now are not from Mexico. They're from northern part of Central America. Uh, and that's driven by drug violence to a large degree. Uh, but the demographic factors uh, play a role as well, I imagine, in that phenomenon too. And, and I guess perhaps the lower birth rates could be re related to the middle class. You know, I, I know a number of people here who they only want to have one child or, or two maximum. And I think for some of them, part of the factors are they want to enjoy a higher, uh, a better lifestyle. Right. Yeah, and uh, and that's happening over most of the world, and that's it's not recognized how rapidly birth rates have fallen over so many areas. So some countries, Iran's an interesting case. So Iran had a fairly high birth rate, and the government pushed family planning, and the birth rate dropped well below the replacement level. Now the government wants to encourage births and bring it back up. So there's an interesting global phenomenon now where you you do have very high birth rates in tropical Africa. Uh, not in Northern Africa so much, not in the far south of Africa, but there's a belt in tropical Africa where you still have these very, very high birth rates. And then that becomes uh, something that you need to explain. Why is Africa so different, say, even from India? And India, most of India has had its birth rates just really uh, plummet, not equally everywhere, but all of Southern and Western India are now at or below the replacement level. So Sometimes maps can bring up research topics, I suppose, and that to me would be a compelling one. What is the difference between, say, Nigeria and India on this score? Why are birth rates so much higher in in, the, in Nigeria than in India? And apart from looking at states, uh, what's interesting I find is now we can look at uh, regions. For example, uh, on your website it says you are investigating the emergence of state-centered mapping in European cartography from 1500 to 1900, where you say in earlier period, sovereign states rarely, rarely formed the main geographical units mapped below the level of the continent. And for, for me, it seems in some ways we are regressing to that in the form of, you know, regional unions or regional, regional integration. Uh, what are your thoughts on how supranational political and economic unions, such as the European Union, um, are or will affect sovereign nations and, and the maps and, and, and the culture, you know, will the culture homogenize? Uh, how are these regional unions going to affect all of this? Yeah, that's a, an interesting question. You know, there are so many regional un, um, unions of various sorts that have, have emerged. Uh, an awful lot of them don't do all that much. Mm -hmm. And uh, they are opportunities for diplomats to get together and talk. And don't and most of them, I don't think, have that much significance. Now, some of them certainly do. The European Union, of course, is a, a prime example of a, of a very powerful organization. But its power may have crested. Uh, too soon to tell, but 10 years ago, People were talking about the EU continuing to enlarge, uh, continuing to deepen, to take over more and more um, spheres of, of life. And it certainly has uh, grown. Uh, Croatia, for example, uh, joining just a few years ago. Uh, but there's an awful lot of uh, Euro skepticism that seems to be deepening right now. Um, the UK will be voting on continued membership. Uh, even in the core countries of the EU, I don't. I think people want to keep the EU, but I think a lot of them are suspicious about how intrusive it's become, or concerned about its uh, democracy deficit, as it's sometimes been told. Uh, so I don't think. Um, I think the idea that uh, 
individual states are going to sort of wither away is is not going to happen by and large. Although it depends on what you know what country you're talking about. I'm not sure if Belgium has much of a future, and that's both because of devolution to its regional governments and because of the importance of the EU. But you know, not much holds that to uh, holds that country together. Uh, so I think it's going to vary a lot depending on what part of the world you're in. But I'd be surprised if supranational organizations really come to replace the the, the sovereign state at any any deep sort of level. And even if they did, you know, there's no telling when they might uh, fail and then we regress again back to the nation state. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. So you know, I'm I'm watching the EU phenomenon uh, pretty closely. I don't think there's any chance, any real chance, that Turkey is going to be given membership in the EU. But uh, Chancellor Merkel is certainly talking about that recently. Mm-hmm. But uh, it would it would surprise me a lot. Um. Okay, and uh, a little bit switching to another question is uh, you know, the funniest thing we we use one of your textbooks uh, for one of our. Um, international relations uh, classes and separately I've been following your blog GeoCurrents and I never put the two together that you know I was using your textbook and uh, reading the blog and I finally realized ah, uh-huh. <laughs> they were one and the oh, same oh. Um, but your blog is a- well yeah so anyway the textbook um, I was yeah. just going to say so the textbook is a collaborative project and different authors have different chapters uh, so I do the Asia chapters, East Asia, South Asia, Southeast Asia, and Central Asia. Mm-hmm. And, and I found the, the following quote on your website very interesting and admirable. Uh, you, you said, rather than publishing my research findings in academic journals, I now post them online on geocurrents.info weblog, and that your goal is to bring high-quality geographical information to the widest, widest possible um, audience. And in many ways, you know, I, I think the same you know, especially regarding this podcast that I'm doing, why right. did, why did you decide to do that? What what motivated you motivated you to go down that trajectory? Yeah, well, part of it is I suppose I've reached an age uh, where I don't have to I don't have that many career pressures on me uh, to publish. Uh, if I were a young scholar trying to get tenure at a university, then I would obviously have to publish in academic journals uh, to do that. But I, I don't. I have I have enough job security, so it's not mm-hmm. necessary. And academic journals, uh, geography journals, reach a very small audience. Uh, they're also quite expensive if you don't have access to a university library. Sometimes the articles are hard to get and publishers will charge you quite a bit to download them. Uh, and it just seems to me with the growth of the internet and the availability of information that that is really not necessary. I don't. I don't object to it. I have no problem with academic journals. I think they serve a place, but I also think that there's room for a different model, the one that I want to uh, pursue, and evidently you're interested in it as well, which is just to make information freely available. So any of the maps that I make, the maps that I make on geocurrents are all labeled geocurrents map. So anyone's free to use those for uh, any way they want. Um, they're, they're out there because I, I suppose my goal is to convey information about the world and world geography, and the more people I can reach, uh, the better that is. So I'm, I'm quite happy to, to make things available. And I should say, too, I, I have some qualms about the academic uh, journal model where you, where you have editors uh, sending out articles to review. Now, it's a good model in some ways, but it can certainly be abused. Sometimes people will decide who to send those articles to review depending on their whether or not they're friends or who their connections are or what are their ideological motivations. So there's there's room for a certain amount of corruption in it, I suppose. Mm-hmm. And I'd rather just throw it out there and let anybody read it who wants to. Yeah, that's a good point. I had a friend telling me about that. He wouldn't tell me the name of, uh, I mean, it's in a different field, the journal that he had right. uh, submitted to, but 
he wouldn't tell me the name, but he said, you, you know, just like any human institution, it's got its flaws. Um, so exactly. And, yeah. <laughs> and that leads me to, you know, a related question. Um, you posted lectures and courses online for free via Stanford iTunes. What can you say about the, this revolution, this digital revolution in education? I feel like the, you know, the, the rules of the game are changing and we're coming to a place where the traditional model of education isn't quite going to be working. You know, why, why should students come into a classroom and listen to a teacher who's, you know, who has all the knowledge when, you know, Dr. Google, they can get all the information from Dr. Google. And so, you know, <laughs> how, how do you see thing, this revolution in, in education and putting courses online and, and what are your thoughts? Yeah. Um, some of these online courses uh, work very well. Uh, some of them don't. Actually, there's this, um, what they call the MOOC, the Massive Online Course. Mm -hmm. uh, some of those have not ended up being as successful as they hoped. A lot of people start these courses and don't finish them. So I don't think it's going to totally change things. I think we will still have the old university model. That will continue to exist, but it will be increasingly supplemented by online education in a variety of different forms. They can be courses through universities. They can simply be free content that people are putting up, and lots of people are doing this. There's some very interesting YouTube history series that have gone up, and so there are people all over the place. So I see a sort of a, a a more complicated educational environment, a richer one with with many different uh, ways to realize this kind of education. So I don't think the, the lecture is going to disappear. Actually, I, I think a good lecture is something to be uh, treasured. Uh, but it's not the only way either. So mm -hmm. the more the better, I suppose. Yeah, I would, I would agree well about it. <laughs> a, good, a good lecture. Um, and going back to the, the textbook again, some colleagues, sure. some colleagues had uh, some questions. It's just interesting. In general, perhaps you can describe... Uh, in the globalization and, and diversity textbook that you worked with other people on, right. uh, you divide it into five sections, geography, demography, culture, geopolitics, and economy, more or less. Right, right, um, exactly, uh, five themes. <laughs> mm -hmm. And some colleagues, for example, asked me to ask you, you know, uh, why Mexico isn't featured with North America. And I think that's just one example of many of these issues sometimes are, are debatable. Uh, you know, this or that country, why was it included into this grouping and, and, and not the other? And this seems yeah. to be a gray area. What could you comment uh, on that? Well, yes, that, that is a very controversial issue. And we've gone back and forth how to, to divide the world. So you have to divide it in some way, mm -hmm. especially for a geography textbook. So you have to do this divisional scheme. And there's no perfect way to do it. Some countries, we've actually switch back and forth in different editions. Moldova is an example. By cultural and historical features, Moldova fits with Romania. It's basically it's a Romanian-speaking country. And uh, uh, But we now have it with, uh, with Russia mostly on sort of more economic and geopolitical concerns. So Romania has joined the, the uh, EU, for example. Moldova has not. And is not going to at least anytime soon. It's a very poor country, has very high levels of corruption. So it does, and it also has this little um, breakaway state of Transnistria, the Prednestrovian um, Moldovan Republic, as they call it. So if you want to do that uh, division in that case on historical and cultural grounds, Moldova would go one way. If you want to do it on geopolitical and economic concerns, it goes the other way. And we can say the same thing about Mexico. You know, with NAFTA, Mexico is very closely tied in with the United States. It's very closely tied with immigration. There are sizable areas of the southern United States, or excuse me, of southern Texas and northern New Mexico that have been Spanish-speaking for hundreds of years. Uh, so by putting Mexico in with Latin America, we're basically just following the more conventional scheme, the way more, more people do it. But I suppose ideally what we would use is multiple regionalization schemes. So for some, you'd group Mexico with the United States and Canada in a, in a ec more economic sense, and others would group it different ways. You need to come down with one side or another in the textbook. 
we, we do make people angry. For example, uh, the Republic of Georgia, we have grouped in with, with Russia. And mm-hmm. my colleague Marie Price was just talking to some Georgian geographers. So you can't, you can't please everybody and you just have to muddle your way through. And are, are there any um, points that uh, I might have missed uh, that you think are important regarding you know, history, geography, maps, geopolitics, uh, international relations, things that are in your mind, and anything else I missed that you think is important? Well, you know, that's, it's one thing that I, always amazes me when I teach. Uh, I have a class, and uh, I call it Global Human Geography. And it's basically, we use the same textbook, The, the Diversity of Globalization. I, I do it over a 20-week period. And I'm always lecturing with maps, and I find there are some students in my classes these are Stanford students. You know, they're, they're great students. They're, they're, they're highly educated. But some of them have never really looked at maps. And for them, it's a really hard course. Some just say, oh, I'm overwhelmed. There's just so much. And we have to learn where places are. And we have to learn about their politics and their culture. And on and on and on. And, on. and there are other students who have been looking at maps since they were little kids. And I've just always enjoyed them and have been curious about the world and have wanted to know. And for them, it's an interesting and not a particularly hard course. And I don't know how much of this is unique to the United States uh, or not, uh, but it seems that there's much more of a much more variety in students' understanding of world geography than there would be, say, of a chemistry course or a course in. And uh, just about anything else. Geography seems a little unusual. And, and one, one reason is because geography is not really taught in the United States in primary or secondary school. Mm-hmm. To sort of assume that students will somehow know it. Uh, and some take it on themselves and they learn the map of the world. And others, it's just a mystery to them. Yeah, I remember, I remember taking a Geography 101 uh, class as an undergrad back in uh, Chicago, and it was a large class of like 100 people. And we had a general map uh, exam. And afterwards, the professor told us, um, and you know, he was amazed that, well, I mean, there were a lot of immigrants as well to, uh, to the class. Uh, but right. 10, you know, something like 10 people, if I recall correctly, that was a long time ago, they could not place, you know, the U.S. on the map. <laughs> right, yes. That tells you something, doesn't it? Yeah, I, I hope just, it's better in, in other countries. <laughs> oh, it's a little bit better in Mexico, but you know we we still have a uh, similar problems here. And I always joke with students, you know, you need to know where these countries are because uh, you know I, I exaggerate. Like uh, if you've seen those Jason Bourne movies, you might be kid- oh, yeah. kidnapped and uh, yeah. uh, taken somewhere, and then you wake up, you don't know where you are, and so you want to know where the country <laughs> country right. is. Um, so I guess one one last question is what advice would you give to to students and you know people in general who are interested in, in these topics and want to understand the world better who wish to study history and international affairs as well as any, any final thoughts? Well, I suppose my advice would be for students to be active readers in a sense. So if you're reading a story about something that's um, that's happening in uh, where let's say in in Libya for example. And you find that uh, something is going on in an, in an important city, and you don't know where that city is. Well, it's really easy to to find out where it is and find out a little bit about it. So, uh, I'm always uh, you know, telling students to uh, you don't know, look it up, find out. Don't just uh, and, and you know, 50 years ago it was difficult to do so, maybe, but today you can get so much information so quickly. But use that information and start learning it. And the other thing I would say is start building up a mental map of the world. Because the more you know about the world, the more you know about world geography and world history, the more easily you can learn new information. Because once you have a sort of a mental scaffolding or a framework and you have this map of the world in your mind and new information, you could just plug it in where it goes and it will stay there more easily. So... The more you know, the more you can learn. And I don't think that's sort of widely understood. I think certainly in our educational system here, there's a notion that we don't really need to learn things because it's available online. Well, yeah, it's available online. That makes it easier for you to learn it. So go ahead and learn it and create that mental uh, framework so that you can learn new material more easily.
So I don't know if that makes sense, but that's that's my uh, my strategy. I try to encourage my students to do that. No, I, I totally agree because once you build up this framework uh, and then you look, look at the latest headlines, uh, you can totally understand. You just need a little bit of information to incorporate into that framework to right. understand what's what's happening. And sometimes, you know, I do. I we cover the weekly news uh, every week for in many of my classes. You know, five, we spend five or ten minutes and. Sometimes the students are amazed where I make comments, and then a week or two or three later, what I projected actually happens. <laughs> yeah, and, I know that feeling. <laughs> yeah. And so it's like, you know, they ask you for books to read, and it's just, it's just like, it's hard to explain because, you know, they, they ask you which books to read, and it's just basically you got to do, as you say, a lot of reading and develop this framework. Yes. Well, yes. Well, thank you, Dr. Martin Lewis, for your time. Uh, people can follow your work at geocurrents.info, which has a lot of maps and a lot of great uh, resources. 